Hey, everybody. Can you all hear me? If so, could you just drop a little note in the chat saying hi and where you're joining us from today? Okay, there we go, we've got them coming in. Thanks everybody for joining us today, hi. Um, welcome to our second edition of uh, Kaya Sessions, Climbing Culture 2.0, Creating Anti-Racist Climbing Spaces. Um, we are very excited to see you all here today. We have, uh, it looks like we've got um, a few hundred folks joining us right now. Um, and we know that they're coming from climbing communities all over the country and some across the world. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for carving out the time to listen and engage and to learn on this topic. Um, my name is Kim. I'm one of the co-founders of Kaya Climb. And as some of you may know, Kaya is a digital product company. We make root setting software for root setting teams and Kaya the Climbers app. Um, which are now available in over 100 climbing gyms in the country and abroad. Um, as a team, we formed Kaya because we love climbing um, and we saw a gap, um, no product or a platform that like, represented us as a community um, and really connected us. So honestly, when we started, we really just wanted to make something awesome, get the community fired up and see what we could do to push our sport and our community forward. Um, in more recent months, we have gained a much deeper understanding of what it means uh, to be in service of the community um, and a realization that our community is incomplete. Um, and that's what we're really here to talk about today, uh, to surface some of the tensions that have generated in our climbing culture and our climbing community since this most recent iteration of the Black Lives Matter movement has surged, um, since we published the Climbers Pledge, um, and our goal today is not only for everybody to, to learn something, which I'm 100% sure will happen, but also that we as a community might be able to heal a little bit and really positively envision a new type of climbing culture that has anti-racism in our core. Um, and there are very few people that I can imagine better to guide us through that discussion than the folks sitting with me on the panel right now, and especially Sia Blackstock. Sia um, was one of the first people that I spoke to as Kaya began to organize around our response to the Black Lives Matter movement. And I find myself always jotting things down that Sia says, little quotes and snippets of wisdom that really serve as guiding principles for us as a team and us as a community. And that is really why we asked Sia to join us today and guide us through this discussion. Sia is a community organizer and a facilitator focused on anti-racism, collective liberation, and justice in rock climbing. Sia's journey to transform the climbing community into a just and equitable space began in response to being the only Black, queer, climber, coach, and root setter in their community. They founded the uh, POC Climbing Group Collective Liberation Climbing in New Orleans, and the organization serves hundreds of new and experienced BIPOC climbers by building community, elevating justice, and mitigating barriers to entry to climbing and the outdoors. And 10 years of leadership in the nonprofit and education sectors have led SIA to give talks, speak on panels, and facilitate justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, professional development, and training for climbing gym leadership teams and staff, as well as prominent outdoor industry leaders. So for all of those reasons and many more, I'm excited to hand it over to Sia for their presentation. After their presentation, we're gonna to get to meet our full suite of amazing panelists and jump into our panel discussion. And in the meantime, you have the chat and the question and answer functions at the bottom of your screen where you can engage with the conversation as we move through it. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over uh, and stop my video so that we can all focus uh, on Sia's presentation. And again, thank you all so much for being here with us today. Hey everybody, <laughs> uh, thanks Kim for the introduction. I'm excited to be here with all of you. Um, if you can hear me, let me know. Um, 
I am working on sharing my screen. So give me one second. How's that look for folks? Um, yeah, so thank you to all the folks who are here today. It's exciting to see all of you. Um, I am here to talk about something that's close to my heart, um, which is anti-racism. Um, the, there's, there's a lot to it and it can be scary. And so I just am excited that so many of you are here to, to begin this conversation. Um, it's so key to think about movements and relationships to you and to your life. Uh, and for me, my, my life is climbing. I'm a huge nerd when it comes to climbing and my friends are, are climbers, my partner's a climber. Um, everything else is boring um, or it's a metaphor for climbing. Um, and so my work is here, my, my community is here. Um, it's, it's all about climbing um, culture today. Um, I really enjoy um, leaving room to, to think about identity in an interesting way. Uh, and so I, I'm gonna share a couple of, of my identities with you so that you can know me a little bit better. Um, this is not only a list of my oppressions, but also of my privileges. Um, so I'm gonna just practice holding both of those at the same time. I use they, them pronouns. I identify as queer and, and non-binary. Uh, I'm black, able-bodied, neurodivergent. Uh, I'm a US citizen and uh, an English speaker. Um, I identify as a boulder, very specifically rope suck. Sorry, everybody. Um, uh, route setter, former youth coach um, and gym manager. I found a collective liberation. Um, and it's key to remember that we're all of these things, right? We're not just a list of what our privileges are or a list of what our advantages are. Um, and all of our identities work together in very interesting and important ways. Um, so no matter how many of the groups you can identify as with on the privileged side or on the oppressed side, um, just remember that we're all cool human beings that, um, that can help one another through this process. I have to mention a few more things before I really jump in. Um, and the first is that I'm, I'm standing in a line and a lineage of my heroes, my ancestors, movements, groups, people who have been doing work, holding conversations for a really long time. Uh, and my life's work is included in that movement. Um, it's a moment, this is, this is one moment, and it's also a movement. So I owe all of those folks a thank you. Um, and just know that I'll be in conversation with um, all, of, all of those elements, not just coming up with this off the top of the dome. Um, I also am, uh, wanna acknowledge some other community groups that inspired me to start Collective Liberation Climbing um, in New Orleans, and uh, they're listed here on the screen. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the land that I'm coming to you from. Um, this is called Babancha um, by the many indigenous people who shared this place together. Um, and then also I am, yes, a black human being, but um, I do this work because I feel called to. Um, up front, it's very important that I state that you should not just run up to any person of color to have this conversation. Uh, it's not every BIPOC's job, nor do every, or, nor do all BIPOC feel called to educate, do DEI work, uh, be nice, listen to you, that type of stuff. So I just want us to be aware of and pay close attention to using BIPOC labor and, and also really evaluate where that idea comes from. All right, let's do it. I wanna start with a question. Uh, if you have pen, paper, or um, like just a sticky note on your computer, I'd love for you to write down your answers to these questions. Um, what does climbing mean to you? Um, what does it give you? Who do you climb with? What do you get from it? What do you get out of climbing? Describe how it feels. Write down as much as you can, and we'll do like a minute, minute and a half of that. I ask these questions because we're going to be having a conversation that can be difficult, has been difficult, will continue to be difficult after the session. Um, and when we enter into these learning spaces, it's very key to remember who we are. Remember what you stand for. Remember what's at stake. Remember to bring your whole self, your values, 
you, especially in the face of difficulty? Um, Kim, I don't know, is it possible to share or to have maybe uh, someone drop their answer into the Q&A feature? Mm -hmm. I think we have some folks uh, sharing a little bit in the chat um, and more would be welcome. And if there's anybody that wants to share, um, they can raise their hand and I could promote them. Cool, anybody brave enough to raise their hand? <laughs> It's a little difficult for me to see. I could just read someone's out loud. Um, I think we have M. Hecker who might be willing to share. Sweet. And uh, M, can we hear you? Yeah, hey, thanks. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, what climbing means to me and what it does for me, it really, it allows me to push how I, how I perceive my limits, right? So it gives me the ability to uh, understand what my limits are and push past them. Thank you. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm sure there's a lot of folks that are nodding their head yes to that. That is, that is so key to what we do and a reason that so many of us are addicted to this sport. Um, and bringing those values into this conversation, it's really key. Like, you get to be a whole person while you're talking about these things. Um, and we're gonna come back to, to our responses to this a little bit later, but first I, I wanna let you know that in true climbing fashion, um, two years ago I did something that was you know, not very wise. Um, what I did was somewhat naive, was overly ambitious. Um, I decided to mix my passion for climbing and also for activism, specifically anti-racism, together. Um, and this was unwise because like, climbing is my safe space. It's my mental, my physical health, like some of you have mentioned. Um, and even though I had years of experience in justice spaces, I really didn't have any clue what I was go doing, like getting into the true impact of, of what this could grow into. Um, and I tell the story because for BIPOC, for um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, who lead spaces like collective liberation climbing, all over the country, it's a very similar story. We do this work because we love climbing um, and to be harmed or to be alienated or to be accused of attacking the sport um, when it's your safe space, it's like the thing that you love, that sucks. Um, and it's an extra special type of, of harm. Um, and it's good to keep that in mind and, and prepare for that as you um, dive into looking at what you can do as a climber or as a gym owner or any member of our climbing community. Um, I wanna tell you what uh, collective liberation looks like today. We're the coolest climbers on the planet. No offense to all of you, it's just true. Um, once a month, I stand up in front of a, a gym of <laughs> rock climbing folks who usually are, are white males and um, I ask them to leave so that a group of POC climbers can all meet up and climb together in an affinity space. Um, we practice joy and liberation in that space. We are uh, really just trying to figure out what it means and looks like to be in community with one another. And it feels really great. Um, launching a community group to encourage more people of color to get into the sport, um, it was one of the coolest things that I have ever been a part of. But you should know that at the end of this conversation, I, I can't leave you with a silver bullet to defeat white supremacy in your space. Um, but after this talk, I do think that each of you will be out of excuses for why you aren't doing this work within your own spaces. Um, because the fight for justice, for equity, it's not over there somewhere else, somewhere ambiguous, but it's right here. It's, it's in all of us. It's in our communities, in our spaces, in our groups. Um, we carry it. It lives through us, especially when we think that it doesn't. Um, I am so happy that I fought for justice and climbing because it led me to these three key ideas that can lead all of us to doing the right thing wherever we are. Um, and that's to think very creatively. 
um, and then also to focus on collective liberation. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means, and I hope that I can share a story with Eli later as well. And then also just to stay active. You have to work really hard, and that's key because we, some of us have the option to opt out, um, and it, you have to fight that urge all the time, even when it sucks, and it will suck sometimes. Um, so I'm gonna share really embarrassing pictures of me from my youth. Please hold all laughter. Um, I didn't always do this work. Like some folks that are just getting started, um, I started somewhere. I grew up in a rural town and I was bused to a better academically performing school. I say this in quotations because I don't know what that really means, but that's what they say. Um, I've been in majority white spaces since before I can remember. And this really kind of lined me up perfectly to get into climbing because it's something that's stereotyped as a white thing to do. Um, I was one of very few black people in the marching bands, uh, the only black person on the tennis team. Yes, I was a massive nerd. It's okay. You can say that out loud. Just try not to make too much fun of me. Um, during a time when I should have been really discovering my identity as a strong black person, going to the school caused me a lot of harm. Um, I had to code switch, which is you perform certain parts of your identities in certain spaces. Um, and I was othered by both the black and brown students for being too white, and then also ostracized by the white students, faculty, administration for not being white. Um, I love climbing so much, uh, if I haven't said that enough, but being a black rock climber is very similar to the situation that I grew up in. For instance, even though the gym in New Orleans was built in a historically black neighborhood, uh, and a lot of gyms are actually built in historically black neighborhoods, I'm often the only black person in the gym, even when I travel. Um, this means that I often have to feel very lonely in a crowded room. Uh, and so I started to ask questions. Um, even though I'm extremely well-spoken, extremely well-dressed, and even though the United States has seen its first black president, I still face racial oppression and racial stress, especially from those who don't think that they are racist. So using that logic, is it possible that rock climbing, this amazing sport, this amazing community of people is also racist? Drum roll, spoiler alert, yes, yes it is. Um, for context, years of oppression and violence have kept people of color out of healthy outdoor activities. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said, um, some of these images could be a little bit disturbing, um, just for this slide though, unless you count like my bad form in the pictures of me trying to climb outside, it's really embarrassing. Um, Redlining led to people of color being over urbanized, um, being forced into neighborhoods where housing was where they were allowed to live. Um, while suburban dreamlands were staked out for white folks. Um, that means that people of color still have a very close tie to this, this relationship with the land that means labor, sacrifice, life-threatening danger, not peace, relaxation, recreation. Uh, I can give you an example. I went on a rock climbing adventure a couple of years ago for Thanksgiving, um, and this crag was in Arkansas. It's called uh, Horseshoe Canyon Ranch. If anybody's been there, do a hoo in the chat. Um, and on the way to the campground, I felt really nauseous with fear and anxiety about driving through Arkansas's cotton fields in the dark with my partner. Um, I really couldn't figure out how I was going to sleep in a tent even more exposed and unprotected in a world where people who look like me are shot even in innocence, right? Um, I didn't know how I was going to psychologically get myself to hang from the end of a rope in Arkansas, period. Um, so I faced a lot of racism and homophobia from other climbers during that trip. And then I also just like overcame a lot of fear and anxiety about, about climbing outside. And it's interesting because like your performance can be very much so affected by a lot of things. A lot of folks hit a wall when they start um, climbing outside for the first time, going from gym to crag. Um, but this is even more amplified by seeing, um, by seeing Confederate flags on the, on the way to the crag, right? Uh, it's important to understand that everyday recreational vacations, the health, the psychological benefits that come along with climbing, they come in at an extremely high cost for people of color. I think, I'm very hopeful, because I think that if we ask the right questions, we can recognize the work that we need to do in ourselves and in our communities um, in order to, to make this a better situation for everybody. Um, are 
a few questions to ask are, are the policies of the businesses you own or frequent, are they fair? Um, is there equal access to the lifestyle that you enjoy? Um, what changes when a person of color enters your space? Um, and I, the thing that's important is you really have to think creatively both about the questions that you ask and also about the answers to those questions because again, the racists aren't just over there somewhere else. Racism isn't over there. It's here. It's, it's, it lives and it performs through, through all of us. One of the most common questions that I get doing this work is um, how can I, a person with so much privilege, help you over there, your marginalized group, you're so oppressed, oh no. Um, and I know that this is offered with good intention and it's one step in the process to anti-racism, but this framing can actually perpetuate the white savior complex and also white superiority. Um, I think we have to remember that our liberation is inevitably tied together. Anything that you do, it hurts or it helps all of us. Oppression isn't great for anybody. It has certain advantages and disadvantages based on your identity, but it's, it's not serving anyone in, in the best way. Um, there are better ways to be in relationship to one another. This idea is called collective liberation. Let's talk about that. Um, again, systems of oppression a lot, a targeted group of individuals, unearned disadvantages. And the privileged group gets these unearned advantages. However, there are losses everywhere, all over. We're all losing in our current systems of oppression. Two quotes that help to solidify this idea for me is, if you come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Um, that's from Lila Watson. The other quote is, white people, I don't want you to understand me better. I want you to understand yourselves. Your survival has never depended on your knowledge of white culture. In fact, it's required your ignorance. What this means is when you're doing work um, and you feel called to ask the question, what do I do? It's really about you. It, it's really something that you need to work on. I want to let you know that, that answering those questions and thinking about them very specifically led me to do work to change rock climbing. It, it's not hopeless. It's important to remember that opting out is something that you can do. You have the space and the option to be in this fight or not. And regardless of what you choose, your privilege is still gonna take up space. You operating and investing in our current society, whether it's the healthiest option or not, it, it's gonna take up space. Um, and this fight isn't easy, it's not for everyone, it doesn't come without conflict, and we'll get into that as well, but if you really wanna make a change, do it actively or get out of the way so that the work can continue. Uh, these are my family members. Uh, we have met over 300 climbers, most of whom are completely new to the sport, and our impact extends further than our meetups because we're practicing what community really means. Um, we're working to drive change through climbing in the form of initiatives to include more people of color in the decision-making processes in climbing gyms and in the climbing industry at large, um, and also allow easier access for low and medium income families. And we also strive to motivate institutionalized anti-racism, anti -racism, and that's changing the policies in the businesses that we interact with, uh, supporting Black-owned businesses like Bo Shui Shui, um, they are the makers of fair trade African print neck apparel, like the one that is garnishing my neck at this, this moment. Um, and we also discuss the problems that plague our communities on a daily basis. Um, it's not just about focusing on race and racism, it's about all of us. Like what is hurting us as a community? What can we do to make this better together? Um, we're traveling outside, we're reconnecting with the land, we are doing some of that healing work to change uh, the ways that we connect with, with the places that, that we want to be climbing in. Um, we also participate in Color the Crag, um, and this is an international climbing festival for people of color um, countrywide. Um, we're empowered to speak for ourselves, to heal together, um, and this is what we're doing to drive change in the entire outdoor industry from rock climbing gyms to massive companies like the North Face and REI. Um, we're, we're forcing folks in power to, to make space for communities of color and to be introspective, to think about what it means to be better for yourselves as well.
um, their strength in numbers. It's really important to remember that none of us are in this fight alone. Um, in the history of climbing, it's, it's this beautiful story of human beings doing unrealistic things, unfathomable feats. Um, it's a process to, to, to make sure that our identity as climbers can be a part of our identities as, as change makers. Um, you can bring your climbing skills, your entrepreneurship skills, the, the skills that you have right now, you can bring all of those to social justice. Um, we here that self-elected to be in this room in this conversation, we are a group of human beings that decide to do things that other people shy away from because we know what virtues and values that can bring us. Um, if I do lock off training, um, it's gonna make me stronger and maybe I'll cry, I don't know, but I know that it'll help me develop and grow. I can bring my perseverance, I can bring my internal and external strength, I can bring the mindfulness, the clarity, the peace, all the things that I get from climbing, I can bring it to social justice. Um, so what do I do? That's the question. Um, and I have bad news. <laughs> you have to figure it out. Uh, here's an important quote um, that traveler, there, there is no road. The road is made as one walks. The good news is there are guides to help you, um, but you have to find the right way to even ask the question, right? It's not just what do I do? Um, it's also, where can I start? Where am I now? Where do I want to be? Um, very similar to climbing, you don't just walk up to the rock and then ask, what do I do? Um, but maybe you ask questions like, where do I start? Um, you ask questions about, where do I want to be? You ask questions like, um, how can I direct my attention properly? If I focus really hard on my right toe, will I be able to climb higher? And all of these questions aren't necessarily for you to answer each of them now, but it's more, show, more so to show how you can get really creative and investigate um, how, how you are now and, and how you can get to where you want to be. Um, we're a climbing community, and that means that we spend a lot of time at, in gyms and crags. Um, and here's a, a list of questions that, that folks can ask when they're in their climbing spaces as well. Um, and remember that, that this is not like a, a fix-all. Um, deciding what your direction is going to be, deciding if you are going to engage someone as a guide, um, figuring out how you're going to start on this path towards collective liberation. It's not this like, yep, yep, we made it, good job, we did it, we're doing it. And it's also not linear. Um, you're going to mess up. And your relationships are really what's going to hold you together during those times. We're not defined by our conflict, but we're defined by what we do when that conflict arises. Um, do we butt heads with one another? Do we listen? Are we being critical of ourselves all of the time? Are we redefining what community looks like? Are we listening? Those are the things that define us, not our mistakes, not our criticisms. So what do you do? The first thing you need to do is learn. Um, Figure out the anti-racism basic definitions that you need to know about. Um, learn by analyzing where your organizations are, where your policies are, where your relationship as individuals are to other folks, and then connect with your community. Um, these are decisions that need to be made together because anti-racism, dismantling racism is about being better together. So how can you decide how to do that without deciding to be together? And then keep going. Um, you're gonna run into roadblocks, but just keep going. All right, uh, at the beginning of this, I asked a few questions. Um, so if I can ask a few other, or if I can ask you all to return to your answers, um, and then also write a resolution. Um, what are you gonna do? What are the questions you're gonna ask yourself? How do you move past this moment? How do you prevent yourself from falling into a state of paralysis? How do you keep moving? Um, and then I wanted to let you know that if you need a guide, um, there are folks locally doing this work and it's part of your work to figure out who those folks are. If you need help, you can go to our Instagram, it's at Collective Liberation Climbing. We're also on Facebook. And I put my email address up here. 
um, because you can contact me if you need help. Um, we do consulting, training, workshop speaking, engagements like this, community organizing. Um, we're here for you. And that's it. That's all I have. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Sia. Can we all give Sia a virtual and um, panelists, if you're ready to join us, uh, a, a real live round of applause for sharing. Thank you so much, Sia. Um, there are so many gems in that conversation, as in all of our conversations, <laughs> that I'm um, really excited to dig into with our whole panel in our discussion. Um, thanks, everybody in the chat for giving Sia the appropriate love. Um, that they um, so, uh, to kick off the next portion of our session, we're gonna um, do a round of introductions to our awesome panelists. Um, uh, and uh, panelists, if you would just kind of um, step in whenever you're ready to, to introduce yourselves and, and why you're joining us today. Be great. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Summer Winston. Um, let's see, uh, who am I? <laughs> um, I am, uh, uh, one of the co-founders of the Brown Ascenders. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in the Bay Area. Uh, we do Jedi work, uh, that's justice, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, and we build and cultivate community spaces for BIPOC climbers. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, I, um, I have a deep connection to New Orleans. I'm from Louisiana, a little town in our South. I've grown up between New Orleans and my little town. Um, so I'm, and I have a deep love for the city of New Orleans. I was very excited when Noble hit the scene um, and very excited to see that there's folks like Sia working uh, to help hold dance like Noble and the wonderful Eli um, and working in partnership, holding them accountable for being in the night board. <laughs> um, yeah, um, outside of climbing, outside of uh, TBA, I'm a professor of graphic design. Uh, I have a very uh, heavy plate. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to introduce myself next. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Danielle Sonkrant, and um, I am a cisgendered, queer, white American, and I currently fill the role of Bouldering Project Director of Communication and HR. In terms of my personal history, I come out of a, um, a, a non-normative high trauma childhood that ultimately sculpted the foundation of my worldview and led me down a goodness, almost a 20 year path of youth development and empowerment and program management work. Um, I have been with Bouldering Project since, since before we opened SPP's doors in 2011. And for the last couple of years have had the in incredible privilege. Um, it has been a privilege to work across all of our companies in a culture influencing role. Um, I am se severely inspired by the potential of this moment and the power and capacity of the climbing community and, um, and also for the unending work ahead. And it is an honor to be here today. Thank you for having me. Hey y'all, my name is Eli. Um, I started a climbing gym in New Orleans. So that'll be five years old in a couple weeks. Um, and I wanted to to start a gym uh, and and you know open a gym in New Orleans where we didn't have one because um, I was excited about the relationships and the community and um, what's brought me to this conversation is a furthering of understanding of the last five years of of what it means to hold space for community um, and to be very intentional about um, who, who you invite into community and um, the ways that you receive people. So really, really thankful uh, to Sia for uh, inviting me to participate in this panel and grateful to be here with y'all. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Tonde Katio. Um, I'm a route setter. Um, I was a graphic designer in a past life. I don't know if I told some of that last time. Um, and I grew up in Africa. My father is from Zimbabwe, 
Uh, my mother is French, so I spent 20 some years uh, living there. And in my explorations and research as a route setter, um, I grew increasingly in interested in human interaction and how each of us as individuals uh, faces the challenges um, through climbing um, and how much of that is a uh, function of our emotions, our connections together, and, and that really drives my work. Um, I'm not a, a community activist, um, uh, but I'm really, first of all, grateful for the work that um, Sia and Summer uh, do uh, through their organizations um, on all of our behalfs and um, trying to find my way to contribute through what I know how to do, uh, which is route setting. So um, thank you for having me here and it's an honor to be here with you all. Uh, thanks everybody for those introductions. Um, you know, I can definitely say from the Kaya side, we just feel so proud and grateful to have assembled such a stellar crew of people. Um, and, and a note is that we didn't invite people to be on the panel because we thought they had all the answers or um, all the perfect prescriptions. And as Sia has noted, um, the answers are something that we co-create together. Uh, and the point of us gathering today is to pull folks together to share their perspectives, their varied experiences, and to have as, as honest and open of a conversation as we can about the challenges of doing this work and trying to make progress in our space. Um, as I mentioned, I like to write down little SIA quotes, and one of them that uh, they've shared with me is that if it's getting harder, that's good. If it's getting more complicated, that's good. And so with that in mind, let's dive into some of our nuance. Um, the first topic that we'd like to get into um, is this issue uh, going on in our community right now of call-in versus call-out culture. We have seen and heard of a lot of climbing gyms and their communities and memberships uh, starting to get very heated with one another and especially on social media. A lot of community members, I think, are really trying to do their part to hold people in positions of power accountable to change, which is important, um, but it's also creating some challenges. And I know that Sia and Eli, you two have had some very direct experience uh, with this in the context of uh, Collective Liberation Climbing and Noble. Um, so we're wondering if you could share a little bit about your story, how that started, um, and how you've come to this place you are today, which is a pretty spectacular partnership um, and shared purpose. So, Thanks, Eli. <laughs> um, it, uh, going through conflict with Noble um, ha was w tough. It was really hard um, because I love climbing and I love Eli and I love the whole community and um, I, looking back, I, I think it would have been helpful if I had known what I know now about power, accountability, relationship, and community. Um, notably, um, that accountability is love and that if we remember that um, then we can build better communities together. Um, I like to use this example that um, I wouldn't really walk down the street today, walk into a random person's business and then yell at them, hey you suck and you're racist. Um, that wouldn't be very effective and it, it wouldn't, it would hurt feelings more than anything else. It, it doesn't mean that it's not true, like they might be racist, um, but I don't have a relationship with that, with that owner. Um, I don't have a shared purpose with that owner. Um, and so I think that if we can take time to really acknowledge like what does accountability look like? How can we be showing up together for, for a shared purpose? Like, how can we identify what that purpose is, purpose is and be really exclusive about it? Um, then all of our conflicts can really minimize the amount of harm that's done to both parties and then also to, um, 
to, to make sure that whatever comes out at the end of a conflict is something that's better than what either party was ever capable of doing on its own. I, don't, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, see, that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree. The, this, that idea that accountability is love is, is beautiful. And I also think that, um, that call out versus call in culture is a function of, of the relationship. Um, and when you're, when you're in right relationship with someone, you, you want to call them in and you want to bring them close and you want to address things that are causing harm. And when you don't feel like you have a relationship, uh, it can feel like your only tool for being heard is, is a call out. Um, and I think one of the reasons why, why this conversation and, and anti-racism work is so important in our climate community and also why it has so much potential for change in our climate community is because um, climbing for so many people is about relationships. You know, I see so you asked the question, what does climbing mean to you? And so many people talked about their relationships. Um, and, we really have to lean on the strong relationships that we share with each other. Um, we, as, as climbing gyms, we present ourselves as community spaces, not just as an activity uh, or a fitness thing to do. Um, and now's the time to really uh, lean on, on the depth of relationship we have and, and the community that we're in. Um, you know, when, when Noble and CLC experience conflict, um, C and I were not in good relation with each other. And we did not feel like we could communicate in that way. Um, and the result was, was a conflict that, that created harm that like really rippled through our community. Um, fortunately, we had a strong foundation of a relationship and we had a community that cared about us. And we were able to, uh, you know, once, once the nervous system had calmed down a little bit, uh, we were able to shift from a call out to a call in and bring in the support of facilitation, support of our community and start to have a generative process. So, um, yeah, for me, for me, this is such a, a lesson and a conversation about being in relationship with each other. Thank you both for sharing that story. I think it's something that, you know, when I learned a little bit about uh, Noble and COC and the reconciliation process that you two have gone through in service of the community, it's definitely something that inspires me um, and gives me some hope for the direction that some of our other climbing communities um, might be able to go through and moving through that conflict. Um, and uh, Danielle and Tonde, I'm also curious to hear from a bouldering project's perspective, how um, call in and call out culture might be uh, might be affecting your approach um, and your response to the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm happy to speak to some of that. Um, you know, I at its core, call out is is love, and it is also fundamentally about accountability. And I want to I want to honor that 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 is that is part of this. It's huge. Um, I think the expression of call out has a lot of range and you know when it's done in this sort of uh, non-relational capacity as Asiya and Eli mentioned that there there's not a lot to build on from there so how we are attempting to approach it is by cultivating relationship with folks and really trying to uh, get us all toward a like forward moving solution oriented approach um and not and, and allowing the conversation to be the, the 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 complexity and the expanse of what what the future is um i i i had a mentor in in my early teens who called me out um said danielle make sure that you don't let your means get in the way of your message and um maybe that's just what i would offer um to, to everyone to to like make sure that the the, the message and the, the means are united in a place of love because that is where all the potential lives so yes good quote agreed um thank you for sharing that um i you know 
it, in service of this, uh, this kind of idea of how climbing gyms and climbing communities can better connect with one another. Um, one thing that, you know, we're seeing happen a lot is climbing gyms kind of realizing that there is so much work to be done. Um, and immediately beginning to, you know, reach out. See, uh, you listed some of the spectacular organizations that have been doing this work for quite a long time. Um, and one of the kind of after effects is that, you know, leaders of these organizations, some of which we have on our panel today, are now being flooded with requests. Uh, your inboxes are very full and it is, um, uh, it's a lot to work through. So Summer, I'm curious to hear if you could share a little bit of just the experience of what it's like being on the receiving end. Um, of all of those requests from climbing gyms and if you have any, you know, guidance and advice for gyms as they do the work of beginning to reach out and thinking about what they can do. Yeah, I can, I can speak on that for sure. Um, so I would say that the experience breaks, broke down into phases, right? It was in the very beginning um, for a very short window of time. I was happy. I'm like, oh, this is great. Like people are wanting to look at themselves and do something and take action in some way, shape or form. Um, but that window, that feeling, that window only lasted for a short time and then it shifted. And I think the words that I could best use to describe what that shift felt like, it would be overwhelming and then frustrating and then infuriating right and it's I know like on one level it's like oh this is great like these these gems and not just gems but companies as well corporations like oh they want to do this work they want to engage with this work right but on another level it's we've been doing this work for over three years we've been uh, cultivating these spaces, at least like for me in the capacity of the Brown Ascenders, we've been cultivating spaces for three, almost four years doing this work. Where were you then? Right? Like it took uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. It took like my community wanting to set the world on fire and actually just like showing our frustration that enough is enough for gyms and companies to want to step up to the plate. It took people jumping on their Instagram, calling them out, starting other Instagram pages to call them out specifically to organize people um, against all of the injustices that folks have been feeling uh, within their walls for a long period of time, right? So it was infuriating when I started thinking about it from that context. We've been doing this work for a long time. Where were you then? Now you want to step to the plate, companies, gems, organizations, because the world is on fire and you're at a loss for what to do and you, you're not sure what to do. And it's infuriating because it means that this idea wasn't a consideration for you at a, on a major level before this point. And that's why you're so lost in the sauce in terms of how to handle it now, right? So that was the next set of feelings. And then it turned into how do we know, like organizations like mine, like the folks that are out there doing the work, how do we suss out who's sincere, who's really trying to do this work because they want to make sustainable change, they want to make a difference within our communities? How do we suss out who's sincere and who's trying to capitalize off of our social capital? Like who's trying to use us to help them look and like um yeah help them look better in terms of all the efforts they weren't doing before and it's difficult i have a like if any of you i don't know like I, it's 300 of you on the panel right now so i don't some of you probably are folks that are sitting in our inbox currently and it's working my way through those messages Messages and trying to understand, looking at the history of some of the folks that are in my inbox and thinking, wow, like your Instagram for as far as I can see, there's not a black person, not an indigenous person, <laughs> very few people of color. And now you're, you want to work together. You want to do backpacking trips. You want to do this and that. There's like messages that actually say, um, we recently realized that 
our page is very white. <laughs> I'm like, and but people don't realize the harm in that messaging, in those questions, right? So what would I say to uh, gems and, organi and organizations looking to work with us and with folks like us that are doing this work? You, you need to look at yourself first. You need to make sure that your intentions are good and righteous, that you are coming to this table wanting to do work that's going to be sustainable and that you want it to be sustainable. That once like hashtag Black Lives Matter stops trending, that you are still going to be interested and passionate about doing this work. Right. So it needs to start there so that you aren't coming in trying to tokenize us. None of us want to be tokenized. Right. So and if you're not asking yourself those questions before you're trying to give us money, before you're trying to like partner with us for whatever reason and partner with other organizations like us, if you're not sitting there asking yourself, what does my organization look like? Why am I doing this? What are my intentions? What do I hope to create? What do I hope to get out of this partnership? If you aren't asking yourself those questions before you slide into our inbox or like slide, slide and send us emails, like if you aren't asking yourselves those questions, you really need to take a long, serious look about why you're doing this in the first place. Right, and it's probably going to mean that you you miss the trend, right? Like if you're really doing that work, probably you're not gonna have time to like post a black square on Tuesday, you know? Like you're probably gonna miss it. <laughs> um, you'll yeah. probably have to come back later and post something, right? Or and, and I also want I also want to say that there's nothing there's nothing wrong with realizing that you haven't been doing this right like this isn't about like sitting in crippling shame like that helps no one like but you have but coming to that realization like oh my god like I realize the role I've playing I've played in uh, cultivating harm within these different communities and harm within the community of climbing as a whole like that's just an important first step and there's nothing wrong with realizing that you haven't been doing this work in fact, that's exact. Like that's beautiful if you realize that you haven't been doing this work. It means right in that moment you're doing something right. You're starting the steps to do something right, right? And so I wanna, I wanna say that that there's nothing wrong with being at the beginning. Like Sia said, we all have to start somewhere, and like you're not just gonna walk out the door and you're like, I know exactly how to fight anti blackness and how to be anti-racist like you're not gonna know like and it's that's fine it's okay not to know and it's okay to recognize that you're at the beginning of this because we all have to start somewhere um so i just wanted to to say that as well yeah thanks summer thanks yeah that's it's so good to um have a better understanding of what it's like on the other end of all of the requests and the energy to do this. And I think like you've provided such important context as we all keep in mind. And, you know, being one of the folks that was in your inbox at the beginning of this movement, I think one of the things that's important is that we also continue to that those set of questions that you that you listed there, those are a continued set of questions to be asking. How are we deepening our understanding of our partnership, of the work that we do, of how we are, are both bringing things to the table and what kind of impact we're trying to create? So um, super appreciate all of that. Thank you for sharing. I'm um, gonna move to um, a, a new line of questions. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we often hear, um, and Sia, you spoke a little bit to this in your presentation, um, is that racism is a lot bigger than climbing um, and that there are very big fish to fry, you know, with respect to uh, criminal justice reform, redlining, the right to vote, um, many of which you, you called out in your presentation. And sometimes it feels like with these humongous issues to tackle, um, what is the significance of talking about climbing culture? 
what are, what are we, you know, is this the important topic to be addressing? Um, and as we all kind of do this work and look for a space where we can create impact, but also keep in mind that the issues that we're looking at are much bigger than our sport and our recreation. Um, I'd love to hear from folks on the panel as you're kind of navigating those tensions. Uh, I can say a few things. Um, first, it's it's important to remember that this is all a practice. Like being practicing joy, like that's a practice. That's something you have to continue to come back to. Um, practicing what it means to be in right relationship with one another. That's something that's you're practicing. It means you don't have it. You don't have it down yet. Transformative justice. It's a practice. Um, and if it's true that racism exists in the places that we take for granted, like in climbing and in ourselves, not because we're malicious, um, but just by the nature of, of the way that we have learned to interact with one another, then practicing joy, practicing liberation, practicing transformative justice in our climbing spaces, that, that's the work, that's all there is. Um, if we are trying to figure out how to properly, depending on your movement, abolish the police, or we're trying to figure out how to properly be in right relationship with one another, like have a society that is just, then don't we need to practice what it means to have communities that are just? Um, don't we need to be able to talk to the dude that owns the climbing gym that we pay every month in order for us to be able to talk to our representatives. Um, I don't think that that work is, is separate. I think it's a practice. It's, um, it's scalable. It's something that is that has a true impact on now and on today. And the way that it affects the way that we move through life outside of climbing, I think that's just, I, I think it's the most powerful thing we can do. Also call your representatives. <laughs> Um, one idea maybe I can contribute a little bit is um, I've been thinking like really hard about what my role is in society. If I'm a root setter, if I work in a climbing gym, how do I impact and improve the world? And one of the interesting ideas I reached was the, the idea of a, a leisure or a, a recreation versus a sport and what a sport means in a society. And if we look back at the history of the Olympic games of, you know, um, you know, there's really powerful moments. Um, John Carlos holding up his black fist uh, on an Olympic podium and how somebody who just, you know, loved to run, loved to perform, loved to be in an activity could still have an impact on the world that he was living in. And, and I think that in how we all, each, each, of us, each of us, when we travel through climbing spaces, when we go on road trips, when we step on a plane, um, if we put more intention and more careful um, thought into why and how we are doing these things and you know, understand that there's passion in it and this passion is as recreation, it's pleasure, it's leisure, but it also comes with responsibilities with uh, impact on the world around us, with um, connections. And so those are things that, again, as individuals, we can, we can all take accountability for. And I hope, um, I'm a little saddened that sometimes climbing is a little too far on the side of leisure. And this is just fun, we're in this bubble and we don't want to, you know, uh, we don't want to mix uh, politics and pleasure or politics and climbing and, uh, where it's not possible to not do that. This is what we're learning. We cannot take an action in this world without it having a reverberation on the community around us, the people we work with. Even when it's with a good intention, it sometimes can come out the wrong way. So maybe be becoming more mature about who we are as climbers and the role we want to play on the ecology, the society, the world we live in, and, and owning that a little bit more, all of us, um, I think is also a way to understand that yeah, we're, we're, you can't just go to the climbing gym and forget about racism, forget about sexism, forget about all those things. They're happening uh, 
uh, they're happening in front of you, they're happening around you, and you trying to forget is ignoring those things. So. Yeah, I think, um, so this is something I've definitely struggled with. It's like the idea that people are um, being wrongfully imprisoned and we're talking about climbing. People are being murdered in the streets and we're talking about climbing, right? And trying to resolve that uh, conflict of this, is, the idea that this is like inconsequential and we're talking about it, right? When there's such um, huge things happening on a global and like a nationwide scale um and for me the way that it translates um is that it's not just about climbing i look at it as um it's also about health and wellness it's not just physical but also mental like uh what sia said uh bringing up um the injustices that came along with redlining and um holding uh, brown and black folks within communities that were far disconnected from any natural environments, right? And creating this, um, this institution that put a clear wall, a clear barrier between BIPOC communities and having access to the outdoors. We just recently purchased a home, I guess in suburbia, and our entire street is lined with trees. We walk through our neighborhood and there's trees everywhere. There's so much grass and so much green. That is such a huge difference from some of the other communities that I, I've lived in, in the community that I grew up in. It's a very stark difference. Like there's nature at our fingertips here within our communities. And that's what was created purposefully um, in terms of lack of access for brown and black communities. And then that leads to an overall lack of movement in a lot of ways, a lot of uh, overall lack of physical movement. And then that leads to um, health related issues and a lack of green access leads to a lack of food access. Like it's all interconnected. So the way that I think about it, it's just climbing, but it's also not just climbing. It's a bigger picture about access in general and it's about health and wellness and connecting to the land like being robbed from having access to that connection that ancestral access um, having that being taken away from us or in the case of uh, black folks that were enslaved having their entire relationship to what it means to be in community with the land having it tainted and turned into into something negative and something that you don't want to experience right so climbing is we're out on rocks pulling hard trying to get to the top of something but it's also about physical movement it's about mental health and wellness it's about physical health and wellness and that's a part of our agenda so to speak with the brown ascenders like wanting to open up more access break down more barriers so that folks can have access to the full breadth of what climbing has to offer. And it and that access is an integral part, in my opinion, to this overall big conversation um, in terms of like race within our within our nation and on a global scale. Thank you all for sharing. Um, those responses. And, and I think one thing that comes to mind is a, a message, Tonde, that you've always imparted on us, which is that climbing is just a metaphor for becoming a better person. Um, and so the same set of mindsets and tools and relationships that we um, bring to climbing and benefit from within climbing, um, I think we can try to take to this work. Um, you know, putting your ego away, uh, attempting being okay with failure, um, attempting some more. And so those mindsets that we're cultivating in this space will hopefully be able to translate to our work um, on anti-racism and oppression. Um, I'm gonna switch to another topic that we've received a lot of questions about, which uh, in particular have heard a lot from gym owners um, and uh, gym communities who are, are trying to navigate, of course, all of this within the context of a global pandemic. Um, many gyms are, you know, reckoning with um, potentially closing. 
um, just keeping doors open, retaining 10 to 15 percent of their staff or seeing a, a trickle of members coming in um, with lots of limitations on their resources, their capacity and their time um, and are now being you know, called to do work uh, that is new and challenging. Um, so, you know, with this kind of context in mind, um, I I'm especially curious to hear from uh, the gym the folks that we have uh, on the panel of how you're balancing um, the tension of operating under a pandemic, under business uh, viability being a, a, a core concern, and at the same time trying to reapproach culture um, and purpose in a new way. It's a, I mean, it's a great question, Kim. Um, I think for Bouldering Project, the the push has been how do we how do we create culture outside of our gyms? I mean, that has been some of the the question for the last four months since closures, and certainly now as we're continuing as we're continuing to build out um, staff training and continuing education, like how do we how do we embrace the culture not inside of the walls because that, that, that we aren't there yet. There's so many real limitations to that. Um, so that's kind of where we've been taking this and part of, you know, why Tande and I are here is because this is, this is kind of a, a major vehicle for us to create culture and engage in the nuance and the complexity uh, without actually being inside the gyms right now, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I guess I can provide a little perspective on this um it's really hard it's definitely a, a, a stressful and scary time especially um on our end of the climbing gym spectrum we're a really small gym um and and a small community um i think that you know sia said like uh it starts with with taking a look at yourself and taking a look inward um and w one of our um, our directors was was a director of a gym, uh, a pretty large gym facility in New Orleans uh, during and after Hurricane Katrina, and really brought a perspective of like now's the time to to look at everything in your organization, look at all of the cultural things, look at all of the operations, look at everything that you do, um, and it's an opportunity in that way to kind of peel peel it back um, and give attention to things that might not get attention when you're uh, in the in the chaos of just doing all the day to day. So um, for us right now, this is an opportunity to reevaluate who we are, uh, what, our, what our mission is, what our purpose is, um, and how we're building towards that. Uh, so that when we're able to you know, be back to full strength, hopefully, um, that we, we come prepared. Um, so that's, that's really the big thing for us right now is internal evaluation um, and uh, trying to, to recreate ourselves in, in ways that we feel serve our community. I think the, any state of crisis, um, Eli was talking about um, Hurricane Katrina, um, anything that puts so much strain I think uh, just forces forces a business to ask um, real deep questions about their purpose and their direction and their their meaning. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I almost I want to echo what what Eli just said. You know, just like looking inward and and why do we do this and why is this meaningful and you know understanding the importance of climbing and how it how it heals us how it can help us connect how you know and sure it's a it's a business and money's involved and all of these things but there's also more to it than that there's you know and that's kind those are kind of the most important things and i think in in the flow of everyday operations challenges um, expansions building a new wall a root setter being sick all these problem solvings that occur on a day-to-day -day basis in general operation it's easy to lose sight of those things. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's really important to root and anchor those, uh, those things back down, um, uh, question who we are um, um, as a community. So, 
Yeah, I would love to uplift everything that Phil said. Um, and I also want to add that everyone should go listen to the podcast, How to Survive the End of the World by Autumn and Adrian Marie Brown. Um, they and others talk about how we define apocalypse. Like, how do we define a crisis? How do we define, how do we define um, what suffering is enough for us to, to pay attention? Um, and I, I think it's important to remember that apocalypse and crisis is happening for oppressed groups of people every day. Um, there are conditions that folks are living in that if the majority of the U.S. were experiencing it, it would be a crisis, it would be an apocalypse. And there's an opportunity here to learn from the voices of individuals who experience that on a routine basis. Um, learn from those individuals, listen to those individuals, decide if the things that you value are worth valuing, decide if it's possible to value something else, um, and remember that like, there's no better time. There's, there's no better time except for this moment. Um, in the chat, um, someone asked, how can we fight for gyms to spend labor and money right now and being anti-racist while the gym business is um, trying to stay above water? And I think it's important to remember that lots of people are trying to stay above water. All of us as human beings are trying to stay above water um, and finding out and exploring the ways that we don't support one another in that is only going to help all of us um, to survive better, to, to be in better relationship. I'd maybe also like to offer that uh, while we are in an economic fallout, a lot of a lot of the work of unpack unpacking and dismantling the racism that we internalize is not an economic question. Uh, Self work, education, interrogating, becoming more aware, and engaging in complexity, and viewing the world through 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 a multifaceted lens. Um, these, these types of things are, yes, they, they do have economic output, but it's work that we can be doing. And also it, it, is, it is the place where we must begin. So um, I think it, it's, 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 it's both and, and I think that there is a lot of opportunity here, even while gyms are experiencing this fallout for us to continue to do, to advance our communities. Yeah, I guess uh, I would just add to that, that um, ultimately in business and relationship, gyms are accountable to their communities. Um, and, you know, anti-racism is not something that can only like happen on the sunny days in convenient times. Um, I, I would encourage reaching out to uh, the leadership at your gym and and asking them what is what is your stance on anti-racism and when when you get an answer to that uh, the follow-up question is well great what resources are you putting behind it um and i i know that as as business owners and individuals we're all feeling the crunch right now we're all feeling a little bit of strain um and for me and for us at, at noble i feel like um, this is an opportunity for us to look at the type of community we're building and the type of solidarity that we have with one another. Um, so I would encourage you to, to reach out and, and ask, ask some uncomfortable questions and uh, poke around to, to get some answers. Um, and I see some questions popping up in the chat too around, you know, what to do in the situations where your gym leadership may not be there and they have not yet arrived at that um, understanding of the investment that it takes um, both economic and emotional and relational to do that work so um, what advice could we give to you know climbers in communities who may not be in the positions of power but may be committed and looking for ways to engage in this work um, any recommendations or advice that we would offer to them Um, an idea that I guess 
uh, in many ways, I'm a person of color. Um, I'm, I'm biracial and um, I've benefited of, you know, I've, I've had privilege and I've had discrimination against me. I hold both of those things. And I think Sia explained it very well. We are, we're always a complex mix of all of those things. So I'm also in a process of interrogation about um, this, this identity um, and um, how to, some of these issues are hard to word sometimes, um, how to um, address uh, the, the um, I'm gonna take a pause. I'm gonna pass it on and we'll come back to it when my idea is more fully formed. Um, I was uh, reading the question and answer when you asked the question, I apologize. So you're saying the question is um, for folks who may not uh, feel that they are, is it like for folks who feel like, just what's the question? I won't even try to rephrase it. <laughs> okay, so what I saw in the chat was um, someone speaking up about, you know, what to do. A lot of this conversation has been around how can we um, impart a perspective upon gym leadership to invest, to take action. Um, but there are just some people who are in the situation where their gym leadership isn't there yet. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get there, but at the moment, um, they don't have that support. So what could I individually as a climber in my community begin to do to try and shape the culture or to hold leadership accountable? Any advice that, um, you know, you would give for people who are facing that resistance right now? I've shaped my thought. All right, Tande, you're up. <laughs> um, I think, um... The, in, in, this, in this struggle, everybody's at moving at different speeds through all of these processes. Um, organizations are, uh, and they can tend to be more cumbersome and more slow in their process. Um, like I started describing earlier, my process, uh, even though I'm a person of color, um, I feel like I'm not done. I still have questions to answer. I still have things to resolve in um, my identity, my behavior, um, how I relate to work. And one thing I'm certainly feeling, and maybe it's tied to how I reacted to call out culture all over the internet, and is that um, when somebody's not ready, pushing them or you know trying to press out of them that they have accountability and responsibility is not necessarily the most important thing. It doesn't mean they're never going to react, um, but maybe in that moment they don't have an answer. Um, it's not that we shouldn't put pressure on organi organizations to improve and to be better but i also think you know sometimes it can be done in different ways um where i was going with this is um the word community um and how we think about it and how we understand it and sure we have a gym our gym and when we go there we don't interact with with um the, the ownership necessarily all the time on the contrary we we interact with the people who are in there and sometimes it's just with the people who are there on Thursday night, because that's when you go. And that's only like a, ten, a little subset of those people. And maybe just starting a conversation there, like that's your community. Those are your people. That's where problems are happening. Um, and the truth is the effect and the weight of that in, in, on the Thursday night, month after month, you know, week after week will build. And then it spreads to people who are also coming on Thursday and Mondays. And, you know, and it's going to spread and that will put pressure on the business to say, well, we can't avoid this question anymore. We have to come up with something. And we all wish and hope that it can be a dialogue, but some people are going to have to be pushed. Some people are going to have to be nudged. Some people are going to have to be shoved into a better world. Um, and we all hope it doesn't come to that, that we can sit around a table um, and, you know, uh, Sia and Eli described how that can be sometimes they can be conflict, they can be disagreement. And then you sit down and you, you cool down, you talk about it, understand each other. Um, and, and that can lead to some things. So, uh, again, Sia and her presentation spoke to the fact that there is no path and 
this idea that as members of a climbing gym, we have to put pressure. That's the one way. The one way we can solve this is everybody in the climbing gym has to go to ownership and say, do something about this. Um, I know for a fact, a lot of climbing gym owners are asking themselves these questions. They don't have answers. And that's, you know, everybody depending on their level is going to be, you know, addressing this differently. So um, I think you have to have an open-mindedness and imagination, some empathy, some understanding to figure out how to put energy and effort so that um, you can, you can contribute positively, um, you know, uh, picking up every battle and every fight and, you know, taking it to, taking it to, to the front line every single time. It's sometimes necessary as sadly we've seen in past months uh, at many different scales, but maybe there are, they can be different ways and each of you in your communities can can ask those questions that took a minute to come out thank you for your patience <laughs> always worth the wait one day um we are about 10 minutes away from our closing time so i wanted to ask the panelists if there was anything um in the chat any uh topics that you would like to surface um before we kind of get to our closing remarks I'm sorry, I know I just went, but there is one thing I wanted to talk about, um, which is my own specialty, um, root setting in particular. Um, and I wanna talk about um, the, the concept of diversity in climbing, uh, the idea of diversity of movement, how we are challenged as climbers, regardless of skin color, height, and you know. Um, and I'd like to think that the fact that brings us all here, this group today, or brings us into climbing gyms or into outdoor spaces. Um, the fact that we're climbers is somewhat um, an, an advantage over people who don't climb, you know, um, that we can use how, who we are as climbers to overcome this. Climbing changed my life. Ch climbing got me to travel around the world. Climbing got me to discover uh, places in nature that I never would have been to otherwise, to encounter and meet people in so many different ways. Um, the passion was sparked by the quality of the rocks and the places that I was in. If the, prop the proposal now in climbing gyms is that people are going to produce the climbing, I think the, the, the value of that gift we give to people, the quality has to be there. If we give people bad food, they will have bad quality lives. They will, like uh, someone was speaking to earlier, um, you know, not having access to green space, not having a possibility of being healthy. Climbing can be part of uh, mental health, uh, physical health, um, self-growth, uh, um, understanding how to overcome obstacles. All of this is real. But it also doesn't happen if you, if you produce McDonald's level climbing. You have to create rich, vibrant, vegetable-filled, diverse climbing. Um, and uh, I'll say it flat out, I don't think the root setting in the world in general is high enough. We need to work harder on producing more organic climbing, more, you know, and we have a model. We have the richness of the climbing in the world to inspire us. We have so many created, creative uh, root setters out there who, who, can, who, who should be supported, and, um, and so, you know, it's arguable whether climbing is the main product of a climbing gym. Uh, it's a vast and broad conversation, but we can all agree it's a very important part of it. And I think um, we can cultivate diversity and exposing people to different types of climbing um, and creating a space where different people can engage in different ways. And one person's going to have an advantage on this boulder and then support somebody who has a disadvantage on it. And then vice versa on the next boulder, the, the, the advantages switch around because we're different people. Mentally, we're different physically, and that's such a gift. Um, and, and it's a metaphor for this, all of these issues that we're, we're working through right now. So um, I, I, because I know there's uh, gym owners here and climbers, um, better root setting, more diverse. Like how, what's the range of movement that's available in your climbing gym? Um, and I think that's a, a really cool channel. So I just wanted to place that for everyone. Thank you. 
All right, there's a question in the chat that I wanted us to talk about. It's um, the question says, uh, can someone speak about being transparent in the work too? Um, and this is an idea that a subject that's been in the front of my mind for a while now. It's uh, the idea of companies and organizations and gyms that are actively engaging in this work. Um, should they engage in this work in silence or should they engage in this work in a very public, very visible way so that folks can see it? And it's difficult, right? Because um, on, because, and it kind of is adversely affected by call out culture. If a gym is trying to engage in this work in a public platform, and what are our public platforms like Instagram, mainly, maybe Twitter, <laughs> like if they're trying to engage maybe through their own website or producing other content or maybe through community forums, like if they're trying to engage in this work in a public way, there's always going to be someone who's calling them out as being inauthentic and that they're doing this in a public way because they just want the cloud of being seen doing this work right but i think on many levels it's really important that we engage in these conversations and do this work in a really public way on public platforms and have it be visible because one it shows say there's a gem struggling trying to understand how do we even start and then there's a gem that's publicly showing this is how we started this is what we're doing this is where we are every stage of the process then that gives information to this other gem space that's trying to figure out what to do next how do we even start this conversation actively having a conversation on a public platform about what like we say jedi we say justice equity inclusion diversity we say these things but like having a conversation about what each of those individual letters actually means and what it means to take those individual letters and turn them into both self self-evaluation within your organization and outward action and then another company that has no idea what those letters mean or an individual person individual climber can see that conversation and say oh that's what it like i understand what justice means logically but that's what just that's how justice can translate within these spaces um so i i, I think it's so important uh, to have these conversations in a public way and i think companies are shying away from doing that because they're worried about the backlash of what that's going to look like uh, in terms of our call out culture and the easy accessibility for someone to step in and type up some things and walk away from the screen. And I think there has to be balance, like calling people to task is important, but also remembering the like that everyone we all mess up. I mess up all of us on the panel we all mess up we don't get it right all the time and that there needs to be space for people to get it right to mess up to make corrections and if that can happen with a lot of transparency if that can happen with a lot of visibility it only helps the whole of the fight that we're all in right so yeah that's i just i've been thinking a lot about that and wanted to touch on that question i know that we are running out of time but i want to also uh, talk about Miguel's question in the Q&A, is that okay? Um, I'm not gonna read it fully, but um, just some expert or excerpts. Um, gyms are almost always, whether intentional or not, engines of displacement, gentrification, and extraction. And there is a racial, a racial dimension to all of this. Similarly, recreation outside is fundamentally tied to a colonial project. I wonder what the panelists think about our responsibility to address some of these issues. Um, I believe that we can get to a place of over complicating um, the big giant systems that, that are holding certain individuals down um, based on their identity. What I mean by that is that we can feel like there's nothing we can do about them. We can feel like they are invisible systems that exist somewhere that we can't address. Um, and the reason that I do the work that I do and what I hope to inspire others to do is to take on these projects, to address these issues within their climbing gyms, to address these issues within the spaces, to carry themselves as if they have to carry the burden of these responsibilities 
because what that does is instead of um, me just saying that you know displacement is a problem what it allows me to do is to fully understand the way that i participate in displacement it allows me to fully understand the way that where my money goes participates in displacement and then we can have a conversation as a community of individuals to find out okay how can we be better about not exploiting the labor of individuals in order to staff our front desk how can we be careful in uh, selecting our gym's next expansion location so that it's not participatory in, uh, in gentrification. How can we pay reparations to the indigenous people who were the original folks of this land? Um, I think that if you have something to tie those ideas to, something as tangible as climbing for you, something as tangible as the place that you climb, then it allows you to address all of those issues in a real way and it doesn't get you to a place of being so heady about them, if that makes sense. Okay, um, I wanna just, uh, we're right at 12.30 um, and want to uh, just give one more moment if there's anyone on the panel that would like to address any final questions. Um, And if there's not, then I will ask one uh, final question to the panelists to kind of close us out. Um, and yet again, it comes from a Nicaea quote. Uh, and, and the question that I'll ask um, as we kind of leave the conversation, um, which is, you know, ju just a beginning. We're still so much just at the beginning. There's so much to do. There's a lifetime of work ahead. Um, and as we kind of move from, from this moment into our next steps, um, what is the next question that you are asking yourselves? Um, what is the thing that you're pondering, that you're considering, that you're exploring? Um, and if you could share that as a piece of inspiration with our audience, I think we'll use that to kind of wrap up um, this conversation, which is really just supposed to be the beginning of many questions to follow. So uh, I'll leave you guys with that and, and hope to hear your last pits of wisdom um, and thanks everybody for, for being here. For me, I guess I kind of spoke to it a little earlier. Um, I'm, I'm trying to approach these problems in, although I do, I'm part of uh, an organization, I work for Bouldering Projects, um, I, I work all over the world with different organizations, I'm still trying to resolve the question of how do I improve the immediate world around me, like things that are very, very close, because I feel like if I reach too far and then I realize, oh, right here was something that didn't feel right or actually I didn't pay attention to, um, uh, that's not, that's just not gonna, it's gonna like crumble the whole edifice of that work. So really just trying to figure out the questions on a day-to-day -day basis of, you know, where do my prejudice lie? Where am I, um, you know, on a very, very personal level and in all my actions at the climbing gym, at the crag, when I'm at the supermarket, um, am, am I true to the things that I claim I stand for um, in the full understanding of everything they are? Um, and I will say the one I'm stuck on most uh, right now is things I buy because there seems to be so much money, so much uh, power held in money. Um, when I purchase anything, every time I pull out my card, every time I'm paying for something, um, what is happening? So it's true in the microcosm of climbing and we've seen lots of issues around that, but, um, but it's true every day. Um, and that's, one, that's, that's, the, that's the question that's needling me right now. Uh, my question has been uh, who is centered and why um, and this
This is also important as we look at the work that we're doing in anti-racism and the work that we're doing um, as we're making our, our spaces more just. Um, the, the, reason, the reason for that is because we can often, in a conversation where we are um, thinking about racial equity or gender equity or, or whatever it is, um, we will think about the people in power and how to convince them that this is a fight or we'll think about how we can make those in power better people so that then they can understand and then maybe they'll um, give up some of their privilege. And I don't know that that's necessarily the right approach. Um, we all often spend time like holding those folks accountable, holding people in power accountable and spending our labor and our energy convincing people that there is a fight to be had. And um, I think what we should be focused on is the beauty and the magic and the power of those that have been oppressed um, and, and really cultivating all of the beautiful virtues of those groups um, and all of the individuals within those groups. Um, so what, what does it mean to show up for those reasons and center those experiences? And how does that change the way that we work with one another um, instead of taking the perspective of what can we do to make gyms better? That can go on for 10 more minutes, but I'll stop there. Um, for me, one of my favorite feelings as a climber um, and then later as a gym owner was to uh, bring a friend or see someone new come into the gym who's never experienced climbing and watch them have this experience of empowerment and of liberation and of just pure joy. And I think every climber loves to like bring their friend and watch them like kind of crack open in that way and have that experience. Um, and I think, you know, the question I'm asking myself and I think white people in the climate community be asking is why is that experience so accessible for some and so inaccessible for others or not even just inaccessible, but why is the space that um, creates empowerment and liberation for me so easily um, causing fear, or anxiety or harm for someone else? Um, and the follow up would be, what, what do we do to change that? Um, how, how do we make this space feel empowering for everyone? Um, and and what, are, what are the places that, that need more attention and more resources um, in order for us to have that shared experience? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. I'll put on my gym leader hat um, specifically and just say that the, the big questions that I'm asking is, everyone, every individual is coming into this from a different perspective. And what is the work of sort of meeting everyone where they're at and creating this critical mass that actually changes and influences what the culture feels like. And um, I believe that that is a, maybe in some ways an unanswerable question, but certainly the, the kind of path that we are taking right now. Thank you for the time today. Um, and I think for me, a question that is in the front of our minds, especially as we are uh, partnering and working with other organizations um, and figuring out what it's gonna look like for us moving forward, uh, maybe expanding to other cities, is how do we do this work um, in a way that um, doesn't bring harm to our communities? Um, how do we make sure that um, the people, the spaces that we uh, cultivate community in, that they're actually safe spaces um, for us to be doing this work in? Um, and that's like the, I, I really loved a lot of the questions that my, uh, my fellow panelists brought up. And uh, for me, this is like the question I, I lose sleep over, right? Like trying to figure out how do I, how do, I specifically and TBA as a whole, how do we do this work in a way that does not generate harm? Um, 
Thanks for all of those questions, all of the thoughts um, and the perspectives. And Summer, that, that one hits home. Um, so uh, it, it captures so much of the moment that we're in and the opportunity that we have to try and create some change and do something different. Um, and also the responsibility that we all have to do that, um, uh, to do that work well and to do that work in true partnership. Um, and uh, you know that has been, um, it's such my pleasure and my honor to get to work with all of you as we try to navigate this as Kaya, as we try to navigate this in support of the climbers out there that are part of our community, the gyms that are out there, and the brands that are all trying to engage in this. So um, from like such the bottom of my heart, thank you so much um, for all coming as you are and sharing your perspectives and everyone in the audience who has asked amazing questions. Um, this is really just the beginning uh, and we are excited to have you all with us as we reshape climbing culture. So thank you all so much. Um, this will be, we'll, we'll shape the recording up um, and it'll be available for folks on the Kaya website. You can share it with your friends if you, if they weren't able to join. Um, but really, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, we'll hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, Kim. Thank you all. Thank you to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Signing off for reels now. <laughs> Bye.